So, welcome to our Taking Game-Based Learning to the Next Level webinar. This is the first in our series, our Connected Learning series. We're going to be doing a number of webinars and releasing a number of academic articles and a lot supported by this gentleman here, who you'll meet in a minute. Let's find out who we are first, though. Um, can anyone tell me what they can see on their slides now? Is it, does it say taking game-based learning? Interesting. So who are we? My name is yes. Jake, and I have been Jake Wynn, and I have been working in language teaching for the last 15 years. Uh, I was I've been based in China mostly, and I have worked for some big language schools and publishers, and I now work for StudyCat. I've been a teacher and a teacher trainer and a school manager. So hopefully I can show you some of my experience as well. But more importantly, who is this gentleman here? Hello everyone, my name is Wade Nichols. Uh, I have been working in the children's English language learning field in Asia for the past 25 years. Jake has just made me feel very old. I started in 1993, if that gives any of you, any of you an idea. Uh, I've worked in several countries uh, in Asia. And I've done pretty much everything you can imagine from classroom teaching to uh, school management, uh, teacher, uh, teacher training uh, development, uh, just about everything. And now I am uh, focusing on authoring materials. And I have uh, recently finished uh, my part. I didn't do this alone, but I finished my part of uh, preparing a course called Fun English Junior for this company, StudyCat, and it is my 20th book that I've been in, 20th course that I've been involved with. Great. Thank you very much, Wade. Now, I hope there's not too much delay, and what you can see on the screen says, who are we? But more importantly, who are you? <laughs> so what we would like you guys to do is to just type in to your little chat window uh, where you were born, not necessarily where you are now, but where you were born. We want to see what kind of a variety of folks we have out there. Prague, did I just see Prague? Let's have a look. Spain, UK. Chloe was born in Spain. Mm. Doesn't sound like a Spanish name, Chloe. Huh. Could be. Ivana. From Serbia? Serbia, great. Ah. South Africa? Nice, nice. And do we have anybody from Asia? Oh, hi, Andrew Anderson Anderson from China. And for a bonus point, if you can guess where I was born, you get 100 points. <laughs> well, I can guess, but I know. Yeah. <laughs> Russia. Nice. Let's see who's fastest, Sam or Chloe. Good job, Chloe. It must be that wonderful Australian twang I have. Okay, let's move on. So to get to know Wade a little bit more, we're going to find out, before I tell you what we're going to be doing today, let's play a quick game. Over to you, Wade. Okay, we thought it would be a little bit fun if uh, you guys uh, did a little guessing game about my past. I'm going to tell you that I grew up on a farm. And when I was a child, my family had many, many animals. So I want you guys to start guessing which animals we had on our farm. And as you guess, I'll tell you whether or not we did. Cows, yes, we did have cows. Horses, believe it or not, we did not have horses. We had all-terrain vehicles instead. Pigs, believe it or not, we did not raise pigs. Uh, I can't read that one. I need to shake. Oh, no, that's <laughs> back. Sorry. Pigs. Anybody else? We had lots of different animals. Remember pets as well. What was that one? 
Hens. Cats. Hens, yes, we had chickens, hundreds of chickens. I also at one point had 28 cats. Dogs, of course we had dogs. We had, we had cows, we had to have dogs. <laughs> Some of my dogs were afraid of the cows. Sheep, yes, we did own sheep for a while. Can't read that one. Mice, mice. yes, we had mice, thus all the cats. These ducks. Geese and ducks, we had both. All right. Um, let me just mention a few that you folks didn't guess. Um, uh, turkeys. Um, we actually had a fish farm for a while. So we used to raise fish. Um, let's see. What other pets did I have? Parakeets, uh, canaries, uh, things like that. So. Anyway, right. lots of animals on the farm, hundreds at any one time. Okay, Wade, I'm going to move you over for a second. All right. Hi again, I'm back. So today, guys, what are we going to be doing? We're going to have, we're going to be doing four things today. We're going to start with the why. Why is using games in language teaching important and beneficial? We're going to have a wonderful history lesson from the Professor Wade himself and look at the past. We're going to have a look at some games that Wade's going to show from the present that we can use now. And in the second half, we're going to have a look at the future and some things we've been doing with apps in the classroom to show you how we can integrate those. And most importantly, we're going to play some games. Stick around to the end and you'll be at qualify for a free trial too of our awesome app. So Wade, over to you. Great. The first thing we want to talk about is why we use uh, games in the English language classroom. Uh, there are many reasons why. Uh, the, here are four that I would just like to, to highlight. Motivation uh, lowers anxiety, intensifies practice, and develops other skills. Uh, the first one is motivation. Uh, if you think about it, kids are going, to, are going to be a lot more motivated about playing a game than they are going to be about doing a drill. So a lot of what I do, uh, basically what I've done is I've taken those drills and I've turned them into games. And you'll see that in some of the games that I show you today. So that sort of motivation is very important for teaching young learners English. And I, one of the ways I like to emphasize this to teachers is that the most important thing you can teach to your children is not something to do with English itself, but it's that in, learning English is fun because they're going to have to be learning English for their whole lives. I'm still learning English, so it's important that they think learning English is fun and not a chore. Second one I want to talk about is how using games in the classroom lowers anxiety. Uh, for any of you out there who are big on uh, research, uh, you'll probably be familiar with the natural approach uh, that was put forward by uh, Drs. Uh, Stephen Krashen and Tracy Terrell, the late Tracy Terrell. Uh, and they talked about uh, five primary hypotheses in, in their, their approach towards language teaching. The one I want to mention today is their uh, affective filter hypothesis. So let me just explain that briefly. The idea is that children who are nervous or shy uh, may have a, a, what we call, they called an affective filter, a screen in front of them that kind of prevents them from learning language well. So it's important to do things in the classroom that lowers that affective filter to help kids not be shy, not be nervous, um, not be uh, self-conscious in the classroom. And games are excellent at doing that. The next one I want to talk about is uh, how games can be used to intensify practice. And I know that probably a lot of people out there, if they uh, thought we're thinking about coming in here, we're thinking, well, I've seen games in the classroom and it's just a bunch of kids sitting around wasting time doing a game. They're not really practicing a lot of language. But you'll see in the games that I show you today, there is a lot of language practice. In fact, uh, I make it a point in every one of my classes for each child to speak more English than I do as the teacher. And I encourage you to make that your goal as well. 
And you'll see how that can be done uh, leveraging these games in the way that I do. I don't do much speaking at all. I just get my kids speaking. Also, the kids tend to respond much more quickly if it's put into a game format than they do if it's in a boring drill. So you get a lot more repetition done in a much shorter period of time if you turn it into a game. The last one I want to talk about is that it does also develop some other skills. Uh, go ahead and type in some other skills that you think kids might learn from uh, playing games in a classroom. Go ahead and type away. Social skills, excellent, yes. Very important for young children. Sorry, I have to get close to this with my eyes so I can read it. Um, social skills. What? Teamwork. Excellent. Very good. Teamwork is an important one. Critical thinking. Fantastic. Collaboration. Definitely we get collaboration. Anybody else? Wow. What's that? Gross skills. Uh, motor skills. Are you talking about gross motor skills? Mm. Yes, true. Uh, even some fine motor skills in, with some games. Anything else? Okay, well, that's a pretty good list. Uh, let me just mention a few that I'm thinking of. Um, I think turn-taking is a valuable thing for kids to learn how to do. Um, we, we have mentioned collaboration and teamwork. Uh, when I do the team games, that comes into play. Uh, also, logic is one that uh, nobody mentioned. Uh, we got close, but nobody actually mentioned logic. But some of the games require a degree of logic. So we're developing some other skills as well that are also important uh, skills. I, sometimes I call them soft skills, but they're all very important. Uh, so we're not just teaching language. We're also teaching those skills. OK, now we're going to take a look at the past. Um, and this is not going to be a review of language teaching. This is a review of uh, general education. Uh, so we're going to talk about how the idea of using things like games and songs and hands-on materials is not a new idea. And you'll be surprised at just how old it is. Um, people have been using games and activities in the classroom, for example, uh, before since before I was born and will long after I'm dead. But uh, let's have a look at just how far this goes back. Um, can any of you name any of these folks? <laughs> this, is, this is really challenging. So I'll be impressed if you can, uh, can name any of these people. Oh, they are all educational researchers. Yeah. And oh, they, they are all, uh, they have all been educators as well as researchers. Montessori, yes. Maria Montessori is there, the one there, the woman there with the little girl. Um, you can see many schools with the Montessori name still on them because it's now a popular brand name. Any others that you can guess? Uh, what did we get there? No, uh, Rudolf, Steiner. Rudolf Steiner is not there, I'm afraid, sorry. Um, that is Vygotsky, very good. Lev Vygotsky of Russia, excellent. Do you want to find out, everybody? <laughs> You're going to find out anyway, so we just as well tell you what the rest of them are. Okay, so the first gentleman over there is Frederick Frobel or Frubble, if you're, uh, if I have any German speakers out there, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly either. You guess Maria Montessori and Lev Vygotsky are the next two. The next one is John Dewey. Uh, he was very famous for experiential learning theory, and he also did a lot of work um, on some other topics. Chen Hei Chin is a Chinese educator who founded the first nursery school of its kind in Nanjing, China. It was called Nanjing Guolo. I'm going to, to just explain a bit about what each of these folks uh, contributed to the field going way back to the early 1800s with Frederick Frobel. Um, I, you can read some of these things and I encourage you to do that as we go because you'll see that a lot of them were talking about the same things even though we're talking from 1800s until nearly the present. Um, Frobel, uh, all of you are familiar with uh, 
his concept, ch the children's garden, and that's what he called it, the, his school. And he pretty much invented the first early learning school that was a, a set up as a regular type of institution, organized with a curriculum and all of that. And can anybody out there tell me, the, if you speak German, what children's garden is in German? There's a German word that means children's garden. Somebody's working. Kindergarten, absolutely. So you all know the word kindergarten, and guess what? This is the man who invented kindergarten. So moving on from our dear friend Frederick, we have Maria Montessori. Uh, she set up the children's house in uh, Italy. Um, uh, it, it was there, there it was called the uh, Casa dei Bambini. And she added a few different things, but some of the things were uh, similar. So she added an emphasis on uh, psychological development of children. And she had this big thing about teaching both the senses and the intellect. So she was one of the first people that was teaching, uh, encouraging teaching through the five senses. Um, and she also was one of the first ones to emphasize uh, children's self-reflection. So that the idea being that children should be the ones uh, who reflect on their past work and what they might do differently the next time they go through. And then you can see that she also looked at some of the things that Frobel was looking at as far as experiential learning. Um, intrinsic motivation is very important to me. Um, that means that the child is self-motivated to do the activity is another reason I do games. Um, rather than uh, you know, teachers or parents saying you need to learn English because it'll help you to have a good career when you're 20 years older than now. Um, and she also emphasized uh, child-centered learning, which you all, we still do that. Somebody guessed Lev Vygotsky, our, our friend from uh, Russia. Um, he will, He's the guy that came up with the concept of scaffolding, which you may have heard of, which is the idea that you should teach children uh, by having somebody who is uh, slightly more skilled than they are. It could be a peer who is a little bit more skilled than they are, or it uh, could be the teacher who provides the scaffolding. But the important thing is that you don't do it in an intrusive way. You give the child hints and so on, but uh, what you're teaching them should be something that they can pretty much do on their own. They just need a little bit of help or scaffolding. And uh, he called that the zone of proximal development, which is a very fancy word. Um, that, that just means you need, you can't teach them too much at once. You have to teach them just a little bit more than what they already know. So that's something I keep in mind as a curriculum designer and de uh, developer, a textbook author, is to make sure that I'm following a logical pro progression in the language teaching. John Dewey is our next one. Uh, he emphasized social education is one thing. Um, he was a big believer in hands-on materials, which uh, we met, some of you may be familiar with uh, under the term realia, things like plastic fruits that you bring into the classroom and have when you're teaching fruits and have kids arrange a fruit bowl. Uh, different schools have different amounts of realia. Some have none at all. Um, some have big collections of realia. I was lucky enough to be in charge of a group of schools where I got an incredible realia budget, uh, so much money that I actually had to have them build a storage closet separately for me. Um, Chen Hei Chin is the last one. Uh, he came up with a live education and uh, he experimented with his own child and he uh, put a lot of emphasis on the natural environment uh, as well as all of these experiential learning things. So at his school they had rabbits and gardens and all of those sorts of things and you still see a lot of kindergartens today that have those sorts of things. So that is the past, a, a quick, quick review of the past and now we're going to move on to the present which is kind of the, where we get to have some fun here. And it's time for us to play some games. So I'm going to show you some games that you can do with uh, just using flashcards. Um, so there, I have lots of games that you can do with no materials at all. Um, but we're going to do start with some uh, flashcard games here. Um, the first one I'm going to do is called Memory. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just show you these cards. Um, and what you need to do is to remember what the cards are. 
or you're all right. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, right. So we have a chicken, and I would have the whole class say, I like chickens. Do you like chickens? And then they can answer, yes, I do. No, I don't. And then the next one is duck. I like ducks. Do you like ducks? I like sheep. Do you like sheep? I like goats. Do you like goats? I like cows. Do you like cows? And keep in mind, the children are the ones saying this, not me. Uh, the hor I like horses. Do you like horses? I like, I like rabbits. rabbits. Do you like rabbits? There I you like go. Fish. There you go. Do you like fish? Uh, make sure your kids do both the question and the answer. You're, there are two parts of the language. Too often we only teach half of it. Um, I like birds. Do you like birds? I like cats. Do you like cats? I like dogs. Do you like dogs? I like mice. Do you like mice? I like chickens. Do you like chickens? Now that looked like a drill, right? A flashcard drill. But here's where the game starts. And I don't even have to explain the rules. I just tell my kids like this. I think, what's next, you know? And you have to tell me what's next. Anybody guess what's next? I like fish. Do you like fish? No, you don't like fish. It's I like ducks. And what's next? I like sheep, OK? So it goes on from there. The other thing you can do is you can actually start going backwards. Um, if you have a lot of kids, um, make sure you use larger cards. We have different sizes of cards here, but uh, we do have larger cards. And if you have young kids, I used 11 cards because you guys are adults and I wanted to make it challenging for you. But if you have young kids, it's like three or four year olds, you probably just want three cards. Um, but uh, you'll be surprised when kids get up to fifth or sixth grade, they can probably handle 11 different words and they, you'll be surprised how well they remember them. So that is a very simple game. Thank you. So uh, what did we learn in that game? Obviously, I was teaching animals vocabulary and sentences, but you can use it to teach any vocabulary set you want. It could be colors with sentences, anything you want. Um, there, was, there was memory involved, and there was also collaboration involved because the students start to work together to remember because it's a whole group activity to try to remember what the next item is. All right, moving on to the next game. Uh, we're going to play a game called uh, what's missing? This one we have to move the camera for, folks. Sorry about that. So we're going to take some pet animals here and put them on the table. And I want you to remember what animals are out there, okay? So, of course, I have all of my kids say, I like mice, I like dogs, I, I like dogs. <laughs> And then we're going to have the kids turn their heads and we're going to turn the camera away. And I'm going to take away one of the cards and then look back around. What do you like? Ah, the camera's got to focus. And the answer was, I like dogs. Oh, okay. And Good dog, Sam. Hi, Chloe. Great job, guys. Okay, and now turn away one more time. Okay, and now look back. What do you like? Here we go. <laughs> it's I like dogs again. So you see what I did there as while you were looking away. I switched the placement of the cards. So that's part of the trick of the game. Turn away one more time. Okay. What do you like? Right, now you have to guess two animals. Full sentence, please. Full sentence. Like. Yes. Birds and cats. I like birds and cats. Excellent work. And then usually the way I end the game is I have everybody turn their heads and I take all the cards. And then when they turn back around, um, I use magnets usually to put these up on a magnetic whiteboard or something so that it, with a large class, everybody can see them. Okay, so what did we learn in that game? Uh, still, we're talking about uh, animals, vocabulary, and sentences. Uh, we're, we're practicing memory as well, but this one also involves spatial skills. And uh, you can see also that I'm getting a little bit more individualized rather than just doing whole group practice. Okay, and now we're going to play a quick game called Off the Top of Your Head. 
with a bit of help from Jake. So I have, let me get out the bigger cards here. Um, I have, um, these are a little bit harder to see, but I, I have, I like chickens, I like ducks, I like sheep, I like goats, I like cows, I like horses, and Jake has to remember all of those. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is I have these tokens right here. I've got four of them, and I'm going to put them down in front of Jake. One, two, three, four. Now, if Jake guesses the word that I'm holding above his head, on the first guess, he's going to win all four tokens. If he can't guess it on his first guess, I'm going to take one away. What do you like, Jake? I like horses. Does Jake like horses? No. No, you don't, Jake. Jake, what do you like? I like... I'll take one away. Goats. I like goats. Does Jake like goats? No, Jake doesn't like goats. Take another one away. I like ducks. I like ducks. Is that correct? Yes, Jake, you Ooh, like ducks. I got two tokens. Yay. And Jake has just won two tokens for his team. So this is a much more individualized game. So uh, you can also use that for assessment. And that is great for uh, finding out if your kids uh, can, uh, can do things, can say the structures individually, right? Um, it takes a while to get through a whole class. If you have a large class, sometimes you need to do things in groups. So something else that I like to do is use playing cards. Um, and you can actually make playing cards that go with the vocabulary that you're teaching. I've got a set here. Uh, Jake, would you help me with the camera real quick? Oh, yes, I can. Just to show you, we've got a deck of cards here that are the same things. We've got all of the animals. We've got four chickens, four ducks, four, or four, ducks, four rabbits, and so on, all the way through all of the animals. We put them all together, 11 animals, and we've got a deck of cards. And the kids can shuffle up those cards and deal them out. And they can play pretty much any children's card game that they want. One that I like to play a lot is Go Fish, because you can involve the easily a question and answer structure with it. Um, if you don't know the game Go Fish, uh, look it up online, um, rather than me explaining all the rules here. Another thing you can do is you can just ask your kids what card games they like. And they'll tell you what game they like and what the basic rules are, and then you can incorporate language teaching in that. Now, something else you can do is uh, you can just take a regular deck of playing cards, and uh, you can ha uh, take those labeling uh, stickers, like uh, they peel off stickers, and put stickers over the, the regular playing cards, and give each set, uh, each kid, a set of twelve cards. Uh, A's through King, and have them write 12 vocabulary words on the stickers. So then they are practicing with uh, writing, reading, and with listening and speaking. And of course, we also have pre-printed cards. I don't know if you can see those well, but we have pre-printed cards that have the word side as well. Don't forget that your flashcards have two sides, and that's for a reason. All right. Okay. So with uh, off the top of our head, we did practice uh, animals vocabulary and sentences, memory, and we got into some logic skills because Jake had to use process of elimination there. Well, thanks, Wade. You're welcome. I'm back, everybody. So guys, that was some past and present, and I know you all probably have excellent flashcard games as well. So we're going to move now into the future or the current, a stepping into the future, and I'm gonna take over for a little while, Wade. All right, I'll have get fun there for a second. <laughs> So, guys, when I first started teaching uh, here in China, this is what my classrooms looked like. Huge, uh, lots of people, lines, and not much interaction. And I'm sure you've all seen a classroom like this before. I think classrooms are starting to change now. They're starting to look a bit more like this, where we're encouraging collaboration and working together and making kids learn together. So thinking about that and thinking about all the things that Wade was talking about, the lowering anxiety and all these things, let's have another thing, have a look at what else is coming into the classroom. And this is, this is what is making 
headroom into classrooms and will continue in the future. I'm going to talk about the some of the issues of screen time as well. So if anyone has issues with iPads in the classroom or tablets in the classroom, we can raise those. But right now, does anyone use tablets in the classroom at all? If you do, can you type yes or no? Thanks, Chloe and Monica. Oh, no. Well, maybe after today, we, we can show you some things that you can do with tablets in the classroom and see if you think it's an advantage to it. So this is one of my classes, and this is just showing you that just having the tablet there can allow the kids to collaborate. So I can send out language to them earlier, and they can have a look at a game or something. They can work together. They can collaborate. Uh, very low anxiety, no effective filtering. They can then come back to the front as a whole class group. Here, they, Here's some of my kids here just with a song. So they're getting exposed to new language in this song. They have to see the words, so they're, they're listening. They're reading, they're working together. And here's a nice one too, where they have to record each other's voices and then try and find each other, uh, sorry, record each other's voices for the vocabulary and then tap when they hear the other person's voice. So it's a nice way to enable them. But rather than looking at pictures, oh, and there's one more to show you. Before we look at the app, a lot of people will say, oh, but what about screen time? Yes, great, Sam, interactive whiteboard. So everything I'm going to show you is also available on the interactive whiteboard. A lot of people talk about screen time being an issue, and I don't see it as an issue. I just think you need to make valuable screen time. You need to think about how long. So if, if I have a 60-minute class, I might integrate the iPad in for a maximum 10 minutes of the whole class. If we're encouraging kids to use the iPad at home for homework, we would say a maximum of 10 to 15 minutes. Here's another example of how you can think about screen time is, here is a very young kid, two and a half, and he was he's learning by uh, colors, by a very simple game, just has to touch the iPad and it says the color. So it says yellow, he touches it and it pops. So he's getting the exposure to the language there. Now, if you're worried about the screen time, here's a little example of what we did. I did recently with some kids was the child had to then draw, uh, draw a picture, but he had to ask, for the colour pencil that was in the bubble that he popped just then in the game. So it was using the language straight away. And then on the picture, which I'll show you, here they had to draw little bubbles and then they were taking the game out of the iPad, which means that they were reducing the screen time but still using the iPad. But better than me speaking, let's have a look and let's think about this idea of making screen time valuable. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I want to play a quick game with you first. Sorry. So let's have a look in this room. This is a bedroom. Now, have a think. It's all black and white now. I want you to think which item is pink? Which item is pink? You can type it in. Oh, not the clock, but yes, the flower. Good job. Okay, which item is yellow? Oh, good on you, Andrew Anderson. Anderson, you were first. Yes, the duck. Now, let's try three more. Type these in. Which items are red, blue, and orange? It's a race. Yep, good on you, Andrew. It's a blue ball. No, it's not. Yeah, let's have a look. So this is a very simple game taken from the app, and now I'm going to show you the app. But you can see in this game, it helps the students have to think about it together, right? Mm, what have I seen at home that might be that colour and connect it to real life? So the whole idea of learning the uh, playing games in the app is also thinking about how we can connect to real life, right? So in this very simple game, it, yes, it is colors vocabulary, but there's some critical thinking and some logical thinking as well. It, I'm going to show you now the Fun English for Schools app, which you'll be able to get today as well. Uh -huh. Let's make that on the big screen. So, 
You should be able to hear that very well. Other one, mate. Other, yeah, thank you. Cool. Now you can see. Sorry, guys, I just need to turn off this lamp. Sorry, guys. Cool. Ah -ha. So, for example, if we're teaching f parts of the face, this is from uh, our level three. You can see all the units here. And we have unit five. So we go through here and we have parts of the face. In the app, we can see that we have vocabulary. Uh, you can pre-teach vocabulary if you like, but I, I tend not to pre-teach vocabulary. I tend to give them a game first and then come back to the vocabulary. Yeah. Right? And then there are some other games that you can use to keep on exposing them to the language. So a simple matching game. Here. I. Mm. Mouth. Head. Ear. Ear. I. I. Mouth. Head. 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 Mouth. Mouth. So as you can see, it keeps on getting more difficult, which is what Wade was talking about with scaffolding. It lets them, it, it lets them start with nice and simple and keeps on getting more, and then it keeps on exposing them to that language. At this point, they don't even have to speak. They can just be hearing it and being exposed to it. But by touching the screen, it's giving them something more cognitive to do. But uh, let's play a game together. Once they've learned some of the vocabulary, they've practiced a dialogue, maybe they've heard a song as well, because it's all available to them, we can play a game. So I want to play a game with you guys. This is my favorite game. This is called Memorization. Memorize. We're all going to be detectives, OK? So this is the monster who recently robbed a bank nearby my school. And we have to try to remember him. So let's have a look at him. I'm going to give All you, right. whoa. Let's see what you remember. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to start again. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to look at him. Everybody look now. Five, four. Three, two, one. All right, let's see what you remember. What color is it? Mm, who can remember what color he was? Type in the color now. Uh huh. Was he pink? Let's have a look. Pink. Great. What about its head? So let's do it like this. This is number one, two, three, four, five, six. Which head was it? Ooh, two or five. I'm going to go with I D I E I A E I D O L A. Oh no, it's going for five. We're going for five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. What hair does it have? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. We're doing pretty well. How about its ears? Ears? All right, I'm going with Sam this time. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. What about its nose? What about its nose? Oh, we're all we're all Andrew. Okay, I'm confident with you guys. One, two, three, four. Which oh. eyes does it have? One. Oh, okay. Everyone was. Ooh. What does its mouth look like? Hmm, what does its mouth look like? Four, three, three. I'm going with Chloe. Let's see how good we did. Okay, let's take a look. Wow. Color! Oh! Head! We got it! Wow. <laughs> Hair! Ears! Nose! Eyes, mouth, seven out of seven. Wow, perfect school. You know, I have played that game over and over and over, and I have never gotten all of them right. <laughs> and then it gets more difficult, right? So, guys, that was a really just a little example of what's available in the app, and you can all have a look at it when you download it after this. Uh, the great thing about that game was, though, that it helped develop face vocabulary for a start and sentences. Did you notice the questions that were being asked? What about? 
his hair? What colour is his hair? What about his nose? How about his thing, his ears? So just by putting in the what about and how about, they're also exposed to some sentence structures there that they might only need to know receptively. They don't need to necessarily say them, but it's a nice exposure of language in context of the game. The great collaboration there, when, when I play that one in class, we have it on the big IWB whiteboard and we have the kids have to get into pairs and they're trying to guess what each one was and remember, or you get them to quickly try to draw and write it down quickly. Um, you have some sneaky kids like my daughter who just takes a photo of the screen and uh, which defeats the purpose. That was a joke. <laughs> so just a few points about the games um, that I think is... Question from Sam. Oh, Sam. Did I also hear a mix? Oh, yes, Sam. So a lot of people are worried about is it an American accent or British accent? So at StudyCat and with Fun English for Schools, we just thought, let's put both in. And it exposes kids to different accents, which is logical, right? Because they're never, never just only going to hear an American or a British accent. Perfect. Exactly. Thanks, Sam. So just a, three points about uh, using the app in the classroom or using it, integrating it into your curriculum is that it should be integrated. It shouldn't dominate it, right? So it can be the central, central part of it, but it should be integrated throughout the class. It can be then be done at home as well. Number two is a lot of people worry about the being on an app would just have, you know, individual student, right, looking on. And there's certain times that that's great to have some individual work. But what I encourage is and what, we're, what we like to experiment more with is how can we collaborate together? Because it's probably one of the biggest skills that they need to learn as young language learners is, is the skill to collaborate. And finally, and we're going to run another whole uh, webinar just on this concept of the flipped class. But what it allows you to do is, um, and I'm going to show you how we, how we do that, is that we can send out homework on the app so the kids can have that at home before the class. So they've been exposed to all the vocabulary, all the sentence structures, all the questions that they need, or a song before class. When they come into class, then they're ready to go. It means when you open up the IWB, the kids are jumping to have to speak and they just can't wait to start speaking. So it's very simple, right? It's just assign the homework before the class. Even in the classroom, you can have them play a game first and then come up and learn the, the new vocabulary. So they've been exposed in a, uh, in a lower, a low effective filter environment. Great job. <laughs> So I'm just going to show you something which I, uh, before Wade wraps up everything today. And everything with this app uh, aligns you, sorry, let me just start with this picture. This is one big problem, especially uh, in China, is huge classes. And there's no way you're going to know what each one of those students has remembered or memorized or how well they've uh, acquired the language. And that's a big issue for all of us, right? So. There is a solution, and this is why we talk about the future. But the future is now, okay? So with the Fun English for Schools app, it links directly to a LMS, a learning management system, or a dashboard. It means that you can, you can see here, you can have your LMS on your phone or on a PC, and you can assign homework over here to the app, right? So we have adjectives here, and this is what's come up over here. It allows, as a teacher, to be able to see uh, how well they've been doing in class. What I'm going to show you on the next slide is, oh, I've already drawn, drawn, drawn on this slide. Let me just erase that. Yes. So you can see here in the app, they were doing some homework here on clothes, right? Now that links directly back to the teacher's dashboard and they can now see as a class group, oh, my class have done really well with trousers and socks and shoes, but they're struggling with shorts and shirt. And that is, a, you know, there's a minimal pair there almost, isn't there? Not a minimal pair, but there's just one phoneme different there in the middle. So that's probably why they're struggling. So what it does is it empowers you as a teacher to think, what am I going to do in my next class? Well, I'm going to focus on shorts and shirt. Probably don't need to waste time focusing on socks and trousers. You can see in this one, this was uh, teaching uh, adjectives, right? Adjectives of feeling. And after one class, this is the results my students had from the app that they'd done at home. 
they had happy, sad, was great, and that's obvious because it's probably something they'd already learnt in, in school, and I teach them after school. But they were struggling with the word angry. So what did I do in my next class? In my next class, I focused on angry. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but then they all went to the top, and angry became the word that they all knew that they got the best score on. And then by the third class of doing results and then, in, and then connecting what I was doing in the classroom to the app, they were all getting all, all getting 100% on their adjectives. So it's a really great way that we can use the games to monitor what we're doing in class and empowering what we're doing in class. You can also see how well the whole class is going. Now, we don't want to encourage ranking students, but what we can see is that maybe Princess and Samir need a bit more support and maybe Parent, which is a great kid's name, and uh, Mariella, uh, are doing really well, so they might need some more challenge. We can also see from the app an accuracy score, how long they've, how many games they've played, and how long they were on the app for. So you can sort of find out whether they're actually doing their homework, and you get a direct link to yourself. In this one also, for an individual student, you can go in and see which words that they've been recently doing, and you can also see the words that they've done well, so, oh, great, you know, yellow's good, blue's good, oh, but we've got an issue here with grey and maybe some issues with these words. So I know for that student, I need to talk to the parent probably and say, you know, we need to remember to focus on grey, green and red. It's just instant information and instant data about what's been happening with the gameplay. So that was the future. Well, it's kind of now. The future is now. And... Um, yeah, I just wanted to show you guys that nice link between the game and the uh, dashboard and how it can empower you as teachers. We're going to wrap up with Wade's quick 10 tips for creating games, and we're going to send these out to you as well. And then if you stay till the end, a little uh, offer for you. Hi, Wade. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, so I just want, I'm going to go through these quickly because I know we're time limited here. Um, first thing I need you to do is make sure that you're, you're designing your games towards your learning targets. Don't just play games for the game's sake. Make sure that you're following your syllabus as, uh, as you're supposed to be doing. A game should have clear rules and objectives. They should be very simple. Uh, you can just model the rules or even just start playing the game and kids will figure out how a game plays. You don't have to spend a lot of time standing in front of the class explaining the rules in complicated English. Uh, ensure that your games are age and level appropriate. Um, you don't want to do games that are too difficult for young students, for example, or too difficult for kids who are true beginners. Uh, use adaptable games. So you heard me earlier, I kept saying, you can use these games for more than just animals. You can use it for colors. You can use it for you know, vehicles. You can use it for clothing. So I like to use adaptable games because then kids know the rules of the game already and the next time you start playing the game, they realize which game they're playing and you don't have to keep coming up with brand new games for every single lesson. Think about safety. Um, I do some games that require kids to run in the classroom um, if I have a small enough class. Uh, but I would only do that if I have thought about safety and make sure I can safely get all the furniture and things out of the way, make sure kids aren't going to trip over each other, maybe not have too many of them running at one time. Um, that safety is a big issue with when it comes to children. Uh, a game should have an adequate level of fun. Uh, it's important for that motivation factor that kids have fun. And you, you'll, you'll get a sense very quickly whether or not your kids are having fun. My best advice is find games that the kids like to do in their spare time. Sometimes I've even caught them playing a game during their break time and I, I steal their game and figure out how to use it to teach language. A note on competition. Um, young kids sometimes don't respond so well to competition in the classroom and most games do involve competition. So what I recommend to you is uh, there are some games where it's a whole class collaborative effort, as I showed you earlier, so that reduces competition. Another thing I encourage you to do is to make sure there's an element of chance in a lot of your games. It's not all skill-based. So some of it's just pure luck, like the, the one where Jason had the cards on his head. It's pure luck. 
that he can guess them. Although he could see it on the camera, so he wasn't really guessing. Uh, encourage interaction, but avoid chaos. You want kids to interact. Uh, I, my classrooms are noisy uh, when I'm doing, uh, especially speaking activities. And I, if, they, if I have a lot of kids, one time I was questioned by a principal when I stepped out of the classroom and he said, Wade, your, your children were shouting in class. And I said, yeah, but they were shouting in English. And he never questioned me again. Um, but you do want to avoid chaos. And you have a sense of, as teachers, what, how good your classroom management skills are, for one thing. Also, keep in mind how many kids you've got and you know whether or not you can get away with doing small groups and so on. And the last one is make sure you practice four skills. Don't only do listening and speaking. Remember your flashcards and so on have two sides. Make sure that your students are practicing both the questions and the answer structures. <clears throat> okay, a final word. Well, you want me to give the final word? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, guys, I think what was um, what we were trying to show today is that the idea of play and game has been in and gaming has been in learning for hundreds of years, and I think that some people sometimes think, oh, it's just an excuse to fill up time and things. But there is a lot of academic from uh, a lot of academic credibility to in, in integrating games into your classrooms from all the way back from Froebel. Um, you know, through to crash and series, and now for, for what's it being integrated with apps in the classroom. Don't be afraid of putting the games in your classroom, just make sure that they have purpose when they're in your classroom. Right? Yep, that's pretty much how I was summing up. So uh, what I'm going to do now, guys, is I'm going to email you all today, um, you, you, you people that attended, and if you fill in a very short survey and leave your email, um, we can even contact you if you want to leave a phone number. Um, we'll send you a one month free trial for the Fun English for Schools app. You can use it on your tablet or on your IWB in the classroom. Um, just to see what you think and then we would like to share some ideas with you too to see how well you're integrating it, how, what type of things you're doing with it in the classroom. If that sounds good, please fill in the survey and check. It's the email that you signed up for this webinar with. And also, all the flashcards today we'll send out in a PDF flashcard pack. All right. So okay. you can you can take them to a local printer and have them printed on card stock in whatever size you want. So you can make playing cards, you can make larger flashcards, whichever you like. Okay. Um, when you get the app, just remember it's very easy to navigate. I'm just going to show you quickly before we. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to navigate. It's very easy to, sorry about that, guys. Basically, you'll open it up and you'll be able to see that there are levels here and you'll open up a level. And once you go inside, you'll see all the units in here and you can have them up on the screen. So um, it works really well in the classroom. You can either have it in topics mode or as a linear chapter mode. I tend to use it in topics mode. Every unit will have some vocabulary flashcards. Happy. Sad, bored, scared. Uh, we'll also have uh, some sort of game where they have to, like I showed you before, where they have to look at uh, the, the colors and think about how, where, which one it might be. They always have a, and, every, and then a matching game. They always have a nice little dialogue in here as well. And also a song. One of the Let's great play. things is having the songs, and we're going to be doing a webinar on songs as well. I'll just play you a second. You look sad. Are you sad? Yes, I am. I am sad. Ooh. My apple is bad. Oh. You look angry. Are you angry? Yes, I So. And as you can see that the language is just then presented. And then every unit has a nice little quiz at the end. And that's so you can get your kids check if your kids have learnt the language. Oh, it's bored. No. Oh, scared. Okay, cool. I think we just heard some questions. Oh yeah? Great. Here we go. No? No. Okay. Okay, guys. Uh yeah, once you unfortunately need to log in online, but then it can be offline the whole time. So yeah, thanks, Chloe. And then once you've logged in, you can just you can use it offline. If you have any other questions, 
Otherwise, I will, yeah, I'll send that out to you. Um, expect an email from me directly. Uh, once you filled in the survey, then you can you can actually choose if you want to be contacted on email. If you'd like to set up a call with us, it's fine because if you want to use it in the school, we're very happy for that as well. So you can at the moment you can we can you can use it, the operation language in uh, Chinese. Oh, sorry, do you mean the operation language or do you mean teach any language. other languages? So we. That's on you, mate. Yeah, any other languages? Yes, we also, so we have the Fun English for Schools program, which is completely developed for the schools. But we have a smaller programs. We have Fun Spanish, yep. Uh, we have Fun Spanish, Fun Chinese, Fun German, and Fun French. We have lots of fun. So what I'll do is, in the survey, that, that you, you'll be able to see that. And you can, if you have any, if you would like to talk about those as well, you can send us a question. Okay, all right guys, if you don't have any other questions today, thank you very much from me, Jake. And thank you everyone from me, very good job on your interaction. Uh, we wanted to make sure this was interactive because that's what games are all about. You've been a great audience. Thanks for coming guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks Sam, thanks Ivana. Thanks, Andrew Anderson Anderson. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks, Monica. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.